Hello, my name is Daniel Silverstone, and I've been working in and around open source software for over 25 years. In this talk, I'll aim to cover a brief introduction to safety argumentation documentation. We will define what requirements, acceptance, and verification criteria are. We'll have a talk about rendering verification criteria as scenarios. We'll have a go at turning some argumentation into scenarios. And finally, we'll cover what subplot is, and thus how it might help with all of this. The term expert is bandied around a little too freely in the world these days, I feel. While I know some of the safety community language, and I'm familiar with some of the arguments and discussions going on, I am not an expert. I am employed by CodeThink, and I will be using an example of theirs in this talk, but I am not here for CodeThink, and this talk is not sponsored by CodeThink. However, thanks are due to a few of my colleagues, particularly Paul Albertella and Sean Mooney for helping me with the safety content in this talk. Thanks are also due to my free software partner in crime, Lars Vitsianius, who is the other half of the subplot project currently. So I see a problem in software safety, namely that we are not seeing automated validation of assertions in safety argumentation. And I would like to talk to you about one way that I see of improving the situation. But first, let's define what a safety case is. ISO 26262 says that the purpose of a safety case is to provide a clear, comprehensive and defensible argument, supported by evidence, that an item is free from unreasonable risk when operated in an intended context. There are three principal parts to this. The safety goal and its related safety requirements. The safety argument. And ISO 26262 refers to the work products, which are the evidence. Since ISO 26262 says that work product equals evidence, you can end up with quite a bewildering situation to try to navigate. Evidence could be anything from test suite results to an indication of a document being reviewed and so on. This becomes particularly bewildering if your process doesn't exactly match the template for ISO 26262, and that relies very much on a waterfall or a V model of development. Rather, more realistically, ISO 26262 offers up a number of classes of evidence that you might need in order to build an effective argument, rather than an exhaustive list of what evidence you must have. So let's try and boil down the essence of this approach a little and see what we get. You start from an analysis of the system and your high-level safety objectives. From this, you construct descriptions of each component and the safety cases around those components. From those descriptions, we get to some assertions, which if met would indicate that the system meets the safety case. And then to convince others that the assertions are met, we collate some set of evidence. There are various possible ways to analyze a system from the point of view of trying to understand its safety properties in particular. Failure mode and effects analysis or failure mode effects and criticality analysis is a commonly used approach. It uses bottom-up inductive reasoning to synthesize a full system view. It originated in the US military, I believe, in the 1940s. It is a solid and well-understood approach to understanding the risks in a system. FMEA is good for exhaustively cataloguing faults and local effects of those faults. Fault tree analysis, developed in Bell Labs in the 1960s, I believe again for the US military, is a top-down analytical approach. It uses common Boolean logic combinators to express the analysis, and it's good for understanding how a system responds to multiple simultaneous faults, but it is not good at finding all the possible faults in a system. In, re in reality, fault tree analysis and FMEA are commonly used together. But the systems theoretic accident model and processes, systems theoretic process analysis or, or causal analysis that's based on STAMP, is a much newer set of approaches, uh, believe first described in Nancy Leveson's 2011 book Engineering a Safer World, STPA models systems as components and processes, control actions and feedback pathways. But STAMP can only identify hazards at the level of the analysis that is done. You can drill into system components to whatever depth is necessary to identify all the hazards, but this requires careful analysis and careful attention to ensure that both sufficient analysis is done and that the analysis does not go so deep as to become impractical. 
Having run the various analyses that we've just described, you are left with some number of documents which describe how a system might fail, and to a greater or lesser extent how that might affect the system as a result. The exact format for writing up these hazard conditions and effects will vary from approach to approach, as well as from company to company. However, no matter what, the description will likely cover the hazard conditions, the likelihoods of those conditions, the criticality of the failure, and so on. Commonly, the description must be comprehensible to the people ultimately responsible for confirming the safety properties of the system. This might be for certification, quality assurance, or any other reason. Also, the description has to be comprehensible to the people responsible for formulating the assertions for the system. The assertions for a safety argument are the statements which, if met, the author of the assertions believe will evidence the safety properties of the system. Not all assertions will be directly related to things traditionally thought of as safety, though. For example, you might have determined in your analysis that a hazard could be that the compiler sometimes, unpredictably, produces bad machine code for a given good source code input. You might make an assertion that, for any given code input, the compiler will always produce the same machine code output, permitting a later assertion that the machine code does the right thing to rely on the fact that it will never cease doing the right thing just because of the compiler. If everyone reading the analysis, description and assertions agrees that with the assertions being met, the system safety properties are sufficient, then the last step in the argumentation is to gather and provide evidence. Evidence is typically gathered together by a person to the extent necessary to demonstrate that the assertions are met. Then, by simple inspection of the collated documentation, the properties of the system can be confirmed. Sadly, this does not scale to large systems without having large numbers of people working on this, or scale to a continuously updating system without having to continuously redo this work. Modern systems, which have to be safe, are also more and more likely to contain significant quantities of computer software, which in an always-on, always-connected world implies semi-continuous updates. CodeThink spoke toward the end of last year at the ELISA workshop about their deterministic construction service and how it achieved ISO 26262 certification. We will use this as an example of how we can start to bridge the gap between traditional safety argumentation analysis and evidencing and the well-trodden paths of good software engineering practice. I mentioned earlier that one part of determining that software is safe could be asserting that for the same inputs, you always get the same outputs. This idea is well known in the open source world and is referred to as reproducible builds or bit for bit reproducibility. Naturally, when we think of reproducibility in software, we have to take into account not only the traditionally thought of inputs, source code, libraries, and so on, but also the wider context in which the software systems are constructed. While that sounds quite weasel-wordy, DCS demystifies this by simply treating the DCS instance as part of the inputs, covering not only the environment for the software construction, but also the rules and processes governing it. In a trivial sense, if a change in inputs has no effect on the constructed software artifacts, then it has no impact on the behavior or any other properties of the system. In this way, a basic check for did this bug fix actually affect the output can help to evidence if work was of value. Ditto, if a change in one component does not affect any other component, then there can be a reasonable reduction in total system testing that is required as a result of the change. Again, as I mentioned earlier, modern software systems change a lot, perhaps even all the time. By integrating all the validation and impact analysis steps into a continuous workflow, you can be more confident that the changes that your developers are making do not adversely affect safety properties of the system. You can be more responsive to the changing needs of the users of your system or the conditions in which your system is existing. For example, security updates to internet connected cars. You need that software update to go out the same day or the next day at the worst. All of this is a necessary part of getting toward making automated safety assertions about software systems. However, at the moment, DCS cannot make any assertions about the safety properties of the software that is built using it. Instead, it provides the first step, confidence that if we do analyze the software systems and make assertions, that nothing about the processes of converting that to production software 
could invalidate those assertions. So DCS can provide us with a process of generating automatic evidence, which goes alongside the argumentation that DCS makes about the processes of a software build and its integration. The evidence can be automatically constructed, and thus the human portion of aggregating evidence and collating the argumentation can be eliminated. This saves time, effort, and reduces risk. In the safety world, we need to establish a sequence of trust, from established norms through to the system in production. This chain involves certifications, qualified people, systems and processes, argumentation, and the evidence supporting that argumentation. Ultimately, trust starts in consensus around standards, such as ISO 26262. From there, we look to certify a combination of people and processes such that we can draw a line of trust from the standard through those people and those processes. Those people and processes are then entrusted to produce analyses. From there, they can describe the safety properties of systems, identify hazard conditions, and so on. They, both people and processes, then produce or provide argumentation around those properties and conditions. The assertions that are contained in the argumentation have trust derived from the creators of them. Finally, either by automation from the processes or by dint of work done by qualified people, we can construct evidence to support the argumentation. As someone outside of the process, we can then derive a level of trust that the evidence shows the safety properties of the system by following the trust chain. We trust that the safety standard is good and that if followed, it will result in a safe system. We trust that the qualified people, systems and processes meet that standard and that they will do the right thing, whatever that may need to be. We trust that the constructed argumentation was done in conjunction with those trusted people, systems and processes. And we trust that the evidence generated supports the argumentation by dint of trusting the whole chain to tell us if it doesn't. If your high level documents, your standards, tell you how to know if the next level of your documents are good, and those documents tell you how to know if the next level is good, and so on, then you can chase this trust all the way down from the standards to the individual components, software or otherwise, in a system. And then you can chase the evidence back up the trust chain, verifying at each level until eventually you can determine your trust in the system in question. So let's talk about requirements. Requirements are statements about how a system must or must not behave. At a high level, these might be business need statements, and at a low level, they may state the exact angle of a screw thread or a singular behavior or property of a software component. While the term applies across the full scale, typically requirements are used in a formal sense only in engineering design, and we use different words for the high levels of system specifications, such as business needs. Functional requirements specify capabilities, behaviors, and information that any solution must have or exhibit in order to be effective. Non-functional requirements specify properties, constraints, or characteristics of solutions. For example, reliability, availability, and so on. The act of determining the requirements of a system is often called requirements analysis. This starts from high level requirements and breaks those down into further requirements at lower levels. The high level requirement is then said to be met if all the broken down requirements are met by the system. We call this validation by analysis, and this forms the backbone of a lot of requirements validation in use today. Sometimes a requirement can only be verified to be met by means of inspecting something. For example, a requirement that an interface be aesthetically pleasing could perhaps be verified by means of some trusted party looking at the interface and making a statement about its aesthetics. This does not have to involve exercising the system under test if the inspection is of some other part of the system or of the processes surrounding it. Sometimes we call demonstration human testing. Verification by demonstration involves using the system as it's intended, and showing that the properties of the running system match the requirements set out. An example here might be that showing that operating an electric window switch under certain conditions, for example, the ignition is on, results in the window moving as expected. Sometimes this can be really quite detailed, involving controlled conditions and so on, 
at which point this can be referred to as test rather than demonstration. But automated criteria for validating requirements are more often referred to as test cases. These can be executed automatically by some kind of testing system or harness. They're very common in software systems where they're commonly simply called tests. There is a multitude of kind of tests available for software systems, including but not limited to unit tests, open box integration tests, or system tests. It's reasonable when considering requirements and validation to think about who in particular cares about each requirement. The particular stakeholders who can be said to have an interest in any given requirement may dictate the manner in which that requirement is validated. Let's take a walk through the stakeholders of a software product. We're going to deliberately exclude stakeholders from outside of the company that we're going to present. And for this example, we're not going to consider customers of the company or users of the product. In our example, we're going to exaggerate the distance between the understanding of someone on the board of a company and the individual programmer writing code. The actors in this are very self-absorbed and they find it hard to look outside of their particular bubble. And while this is not completely realistic, it lets us consider completely disparate points of view. While it may sound odd, just like trust chains start at the very top, so does the care about requirements. The board of a company, the CEO, the CTO, and so on, must have some level of stake in the requirements of a product that their company is producing. Their stake will likely be at the level of business needs, but they will need to know that those needs will be met by the product. The owner of a product is responsible for its definition and its success. They are responsible for ensuring that the product design meets the business needs and that the mechanisms of validation for that are understood by the board. The product owner is also responsible for ensuring that the system architects understand the requirements well enough to analyze the system and to define further requirements in system design. System architects are often the first point at which non-functional requirements and very high level functional requirements begin to be broken down into further requirements which stand a chance of being automatically validated. Although any requirement at any level could be automatically validated in some fashion. A system architect may not need to know how the product might meet the business needs of the company, but they will have to have had those effectively broken down and communicated as product requirements by the product owner. Development teams then receive requirements defined by the system architect and through analysis and design determine how to build software which meets those requirements. They likely understand the full product at some level, but may only be responsible for building some subpart of it. This is likely the point at which requirements begin to take on quite technical forms, tightly defining individual component behavior. The individual engineer is likely working from very well-defined, low-level requirements. They may have to implement a particular software component to particular standards, to protocols, and so on. In an extreme sense, they may have no concept of how that component fits into the product as a whole, which is quite common when software component development ends up outsourced. As a result, when we look at this hierarchy of responsibility and understanding, we see that the comprehension of requirements can go one level up or one level down only. So the product owner needs to be able to comprehend the board's needs in order to present requirements to the system architect. But they will also need to comprehend the system architect's evidence in order to be satisfied that the requirements they pass down are met so that they can then generate evidence for the board above them. All these levels could seem very onerous, and in some cases they really can be, and they can also be much less well-defined. In reality, while the difference between levels may be much less pronounced than in our exaggerated example world, the hierarchy will usually not be so clear-cut and linear. For example, when you get other departments involved in a system's design, such as a cybersecurity department, they may place requirements on a system with no regard to the product's functionality per se, but in order to meet some business needs around not producing insecure software. Another term that you'll hear is acceptance criteria. In some sense, particularly for our purposes, this is just another word for requirement. It's typically high level, often from the perspective of a user of the system, and is usually defined by pretty high level stakeholders, or at least approved by them. It can still be automatically validated, at least most of the time. They're usually coupled with verification criteria, 
which is a description of how the acceptance criterion is verified to have been met. A test case. So let's take a moment to focus on verification criteria. I will focus pretty much only on software, but in theory all of this can apply in some sense to hardware systems or processes, etc. So what kinds of testing can be involved? Unit testing treats individual isolated components of a system as a unit of functionality, and it ver they verify their behavior. In the extreme, this may involve calling individual software functions just to verify that they behave as intended. When the interaction between units needs to be verified, we move on to integration testing. I refer to this as open box because typically the testing harness will have some privileged access to the internal state of software components in order that it can do this verification. System or closed box testing is a higher level variant on integration testing, which verifies the behavior of an integrated aggregate of components without privileged access to their internal states. Verification is done by observing, in some automated fashion, the behavior of the system as a whole. And finally, verification by inspection, or user testing, is still necessary in some cases, although it is much harder to automate. While what I've spoken about so far is quite traditional, more and more software teams are learning to use a variety of Agile methodologies, including capital A Agile, Lean, Kanban, and so on. The big thing which came out of Agile, which we are interested in today, are user stories. These are often presented in the form of a persona, a need, and a purpose. For example, as a visitor, I want to buy a ticket so that I can watch a film. Codifying the user story approach to expressing requirements led to the creation of the Gherkin language. This is a standard for expressing verification criteria in a scenario form, enabling the reader of the criterion to understand the setup, the action, and the checks which comprise the validation of the requirement. Scenarios describe the setup of the situation, given, given a cinema booking system, given an empty shopping cart, the actions which are performed, when, when the user chooses a film, or when the user selects checkout, and verifications of the results of those actions, then, then the shopping cart contains a ticket for the film, then the ticket is sold. Each step in the scenario can be customised to the system being verified, and typically steps are designed to be generic enough that more criteria can be written using a combination of existing steps rather than defining unique steps for each criterion. When a test owner writes a scenario for meeting a requirement, it should be clear to the author of the requirement what the scenario needs or assumes, what it will do, and how it will check the result of that. This clarity ensures that stakeholders further up the chain can comprehend tests and accept that they will validate their requirements without actually needing to understand how they will do that in detail. The test owner writes scenarios using steps which are defined in conjunction with the people responsible for actually implementing the test. This means that the test owner can trust that the programmer will understand the purpose of the steps and that they can both agree that the code to implement the step matches the intent of the scenario in which it will be used. Nominally, it also means that the programmer need not understand the wider product code base fully, nor the requirements set, to be effective at the job of writing step functions. Some years ago, I wrote a set of truisms of software, and two of them were, if you don't know why you're doing it, you shouldn't be doing it, and if it's not tested, it doesn't work. The former of these is a restatement of the idea that software products should only contain code needed to meet requirements of the system. If there is no requirement for the code to exist, it simply shouldn't. The latter then covers the idea that if you wrote the code, you'd best be certain that it works, and that the best way to do that is to have a test for that feature. Sadly, test code is often only verified to work by dint of running it against a system inspecting the outputs and making a decision perhaps on test failure as to whether the test is bad or the system under test is at fault. Given that, your test code needs to be patently clear and correct such that it can be validated by inspection. 
The scenario approach to testing permits the higher level test to be validated independently of the code implementing the test, meaning that more people can be confident of the correctness at the level at which they need to engage. So let's take a look at the benefits of rendering argumentation as scenarios, how we might do that, and what different perspectives might see as the value that it brings. The biggest and most obvious value, from my perspective at least, is that validation can be automated. Critically, this is not suggesting that scenarios result in the automatic construction of argumentation, but rather that creating and matching evidence to assertions could be automatic. Anything which is automated has a lower risk of human error and can be fitted into modern system construction pipelines. By writing scenarios about ensuring that processes are followed properly, the evidence produced by those scenarios inherently supporting the assertions for those processes, you get something truly great. The automatic execution of scenarios which confirm that processes, systems and activity is complying with standards. This is the core of ensuring that any modern software project could possibly be safe. Again, from the perspective of humans are fallible, if a computer can take carefully constructed scenarios and by executing them provide confidence that at each level of a system's trust model it's being correctly handled, that there is a significant reduction to the human cost of making safe systems. While it doesn't mitigate all the analysis, since clearly some will have to happen in order to create the sublevel and to satisfy the stakeholders that if the scenario passes then the assertions are met, it does reduce the complexity of the analysis. No longer will someone checking if a process is being followed need to inspect large amounts of evidence to verify that they support an assertion. Instead, they inspect the scenario, rely on the trust chains to be satisfied that the evidence will be useful, and then take the outputs of that automated process. Before we begin with a couple of examples of some deliberately basic arguments, along with how they might be rendered as scenarios, let me reiterate. I am not a safety expert. These examples are really simplistic, not rigorous in any sense, and are meant to purely illustrate an approach. And I invented these scenarios basically of whole cloth, with some help from my colleague Paul. Given that, let's speak a little about an example of how I imagine a process argument might be stated. In order to prevent uncontrolled changes to the software of the system, there is in place a change management process which regulates how changes can be made to the software. To this end, we assert that the revision control system in use enforces this process. As evidence, we present an analysis of all changes within the system, demonstrating that all changes meet the process definition for some given software release. This idea is one which you find in multiple open source processes around securing software supply chains and I believe something akin to this is present in DCS. The concept here is that something you are all likely familiar with, without change control, you cannot begin to make any guarantees about the system. What I don't try and define here is what the process is, nor how it is regulating change. That is not interesting at this level. We only concern ourselves with the assertion here. The scenario is replacing the assertion from our previous slide. That is, we assert the revision control system is enforcing the process. Given a release to verify, and a set of repositories which comprise that release, and a set of rules for what comprises a valid permissible change, when all commits present in the release are examined, then all commits obey the rules. What I'm hoping that you can all agree is that the assertions effectively say the same things although we've managed to encode some of the evidence statement as well here. But I'm also hoping that you'll agree that this is just as comprehensible to a human as the prose was. Now let's look at an assertion which is a little closer to something we might expect a programmer to deal with. To ensure that the driver is able to rely on the reversing camera being available when it is needed, it must be displayed within 500 milliseconds of the reverse gear being selected. To this end, we assert that whenever the gear selection message is received by the center console display, should it indicate that reverse gear has been selected, 
then the time from message reception to the display of the reverse camera input to the user shall be no more than 500 milliseconds. As evidence, we present system test results for the release software, showing that the timing for the reversing camera being displayed was within the limits specified. This idea, again, should be pretty comprehensible to anyone who's ever driven a car which has a reversing camera. Users of them are pr pretty quick to grow to be at least mostly dependent on them, particularly in reversing in low light or tight driving situations. As such, we want to ensure that the user doesn't have to wait for the camera display when they choose reverse. Now, I'm not claiming that this one argument alone is sufficient to assert the safety of a reversing camera. It is likely that at this level, any scenario set worth its salt would cover things like camera to display latency, fault injection on the gear selection signal, and so on. But setting the incompleteness problem aside, let's render this as a scenario too. Given a functioning test rig, and the release software loaded into it, when a reverse gear selection signal is injected, and a display snapshot is taken 500 milliseconds later, then the reverse camera input is visible on the display. Again, hopefully you can all agree that this effectively represents the assertion and captures the essence of the evidence statement as well. Also, at this level, I'm imagining that those of you closer to the code face might be imagining how you might implement some of this. Let's take a very brief look at how we might go about building implementations for the tests we just described. I'm not going to take you through implementing a whole rules engine, nor something capable of taking screenshots of a vehicle test rig. But let's look at one or two statements from before and have a go at some implementation. I'm going to be using a Python-like pseudocode. This is not a scenario so, uh, function from subplot, but hopefully it will illustrate things. So we define a function to acquire the change policy rule set. In it, we retrieve the policy version and the repository set from the context. We find the change policy. We construct a repository on it. We ensure it's at the correct tag. We compile a rule set and we insert that compiled rule set back into the test context. You can see here the concept that there is some kind of test context associated with step functions, that that context likely had some things set up by previous steps in the scenario, and the function does one simple sequence of actions. It ensures that the changes policy repository is on the correct version and loads it into the context. In reality, most step functions would be written to be more generic than this. For example, we might be able to capture the word change and then alter the step function to be able to load different policies based on that capture. This time, the step function is clearly meant to take two parameters, which we can reasonably expect to be reverse camera input and visible for this particular step. We define our step function check display, taking some expectation and some visibility parameters. We retrieve the most recent screenshot from the context. We load the expectation image. We compare the screenshot with that image and then if we wanted it to be visible and it was not showing, we return the error that it was not showing. And if we didn't want it to be visible, but it was showing, we return an error that it was visible. You can see how by parameterizing steps, you make them more flexible and able to be used in the future in more complex scenarios without needing extra programming effort. But enough pseudocode for now, let's move on. If we think about the process example, our original argument prose was meant to be consumed by someone who does not have to care what the process is or how it's enforced, merely that it exists and that it does the right thing. While initially the particular shape of a gherkin-like scenario might be alien to such a person, they would easily be able to understand the scenario version of that assertion. And through the chains of trust that we established earlier, they could be confident that those who do understand the detail will have ensured that if the scenario passes, this means that it is doing what it appears to be claiming to do. Thus, they can derive just as much, if not more, trust value from the scenario as from the prose assertion. Since they likely could not comprehend the evidences presented in either case, this is, I hope, sufficient to suggest that whatever level a non-engineer encounters these kinds of scenarios, they can derive the value and understanding that they need. Naturally, in a full system, there'll be many more scenarios. No one person need understand them all, 
And coupled with the trust model, we can reach a point where each person at this end of the chain can derive the value that they need without understanding the automated processes to the full. Most engineers are typically entirely uninterested in process where it does not immediately impact them. However, they definitely like it when they're given clear requirements with obvious mechanisms to test if they've been met. As such, engineers derive more value from the lower level scenarios since they show something that they likely feel that they can test. Engineers particularly like if those verification criteria are automated and part of a continuous integration and test pipeline. But if the CEO reads the lower level scenario, then they can likely still derive an understanding of what it means and why it's important, though they likely won't have quite the same appreciation for it as a low level engineer might. Ditto, the low level engineer, can likely read and understand the high level scenario, though they likely won't care about how or why it exists. They'll already be used to the rules in question, and they won't be thinking at the process level about why we need to know that the rules are obeyed. So there's value at every level, although likely only scenarios at a level where the reader actually cares will they gain the full value possible. Of course, there have to be engineers who are writing step functions, and these likely need to appreciate the requirements of the scenario statements at whatever level they are working. Fortunately, they should have the original scenario author as reference. Interestingly, the step function author may not need to know much more than the very tight specification for the step function's behaviour. Though, if they understand more, then they may be able to write more flexible functions, which the scenario document owner can then use in more scenarios later. More often than not, the step function author will be fairly close to the authors of the system which is being verified, which ensures good comprehension. Ideally, the scenario author ought to be able to understand the step function code, or else have an established trust chain to the step function authors. The value that test engineers derive is typically isolated to only the information they need to establish the step functions, but that's okay. Approximately 10 years ago, three friends in a restaurant were chatting over their lunch. They were discussing how unpleasant it was to write the tests for a tool that they were working on. One of them had heard about Gherkin and scenarios, and they liked the idea. Unfortunately, at the time, the only implementations that they knew about were either in Ruby, which wasn't in use on the project, or else were aimed at web applications, which wasn't what our intrepid friends were developing. They set out to write and use a simple scenario testing tool, which they called Yarn. Over the next few years, they wrote a lot of good test suites for a variety of software, proving out that the concept of scenario testing works for Unix command line tools. Sadly, they mostly produced bad documentation along the way as well, as is the want of many software engineers. Five years ago, two of those friends sat in front of a whiteboard and discussed what they wanted Yarn to be long term, thinking about clever features and ways to do more complex testing. They spent the next two years on and off experimenting with these ideas, writing more good test suites and still producing frankly awful documentation. Late in 2019, they performed some basic user surveying, decided that simplicity was key, that documentation was the most valuable, the primary goal, and thus they pivoted to the ideas which then became subplot. They set the goals of subplot, high quality documentation generation with automatic testing as a secondary feature, and six months saw them produce something usable in projects other than subplot itself. Another year got them to the first alpha release, and now, approaching the second alpha release, we learn more and more through using the tool. Subplot's initial and nominally primary purpose is that of documentation. Subplot documents are exactly that, documents. Likely primarily composed of prose, with images and scenarios as appropriate. Subplot documents are meant to be revision controlled, for example, in a Git repository, and so they are plain text documents in terms of inputs to subplot's documentation generation feature. Like Yarn and countless other tools, subplot uses Markdown as its input language. Nominally, this could have been ASCII doc or restructured text, but the authors of subplot are most comfortable with Markdown, 
Markdown documents are fairly easy to read in their source form, because rather than tags like HTML, Markdown's formatting looks approximately like you'd expect output text to look. But not everyone is satisfied purely with words. Sometimes a diagram can be much easier to understand. Markdown supports arbitrary embedding of images. However, images are not terribly easy to revision control. As such, Subplot supports a number of textual diagram formats, and more could be added later. Currently, Subplot supports the use of plant UML for any of its UML diagram forms. It supports Picture, which is a graph-like language describing flowchart or railway type diagrams. Subplot supports Dot, which is a more generic graph-like language often used to show simple relationships. Dot actually underlies plant UML, as I understand. Each of these formats allows document authors to more easily revision control their diagrams and to understand the differences from version to version. Since oftentimes you need to archive your argumentation as part of your release process, to support later inspection by auditors, for example, Subplot offers PDF rendering. This means that the auditors need not understand Markdown, nor the text forms of the diagrams, instead being able to view a fully rendered document. We are in fact aware of some users of Subplot who use it only for rendering documents because they like the Markdown and the diagram as text support. Even more widely supported as a document format is HTML. Subplot can render your documents as standalone HTML, which can then be published onto websites, into document management systems, or simply stored for later viewing without the need for PDF software. And if we were only talking about a tool for nicely rendering documentation, we could stop here, but Subplot has a second major function. Unlike many tools, including Yarn, Subplot does not act as a test runner or test orchestrator. Instead, Subplot can be used to generate source code, which runs the tests. Subplot can convert all the scenarios in a document into code, which can then run under more traditional test runners in order to be maximally flexible. To permit subplot to actually understand and generate appropriate code, your document will list some number of step libraries in its metadata. Subplot uses those step libraries through a data model that we call bindings to determine how to turn the scenarios into code to run. Subplot actually provides a number of standardized test libraries, including those which can run commands, read and write files, and a variety of other features. You can, and indeed likely will, need to write step libraries for your projects. These may vary in complexity and implementation level as needed to fulfill your needs for verifying your requirements. Finally, Subplot's code generation is templated and fairly flexible. We provide, as standard, a Python test runner, which is very basic, but also very easy to use. And the next release of Subplot will include support for generating Rust test suites, which fit directly into Rust's testing model, making it easy to integrate Subplot scenarios into testing Rust code. We provide a basic shell, basically bash, based test suite template as well, although that's not as fully featured nor fully supported. As with step libraries, projects can provide their own templates. For example, if you are verifying a component written in TypeScript or Ruby, you might provide a template which generates tests consumable by appropriate test runners for those languages. You may have heard the phrase, eat your own dog food. Or in this instance, I might say, use your own tools. Subplot's primary set of verification criteria are written as scenarios in Subplot's own documentation. This means that we use Subplot to test that Subplot meets its requirements. Interestingly, we do this in all languages and test suite styles that Subplot supports where appropriate. We feel that this principle is important since it shows real world use of the technique and while I'll be the first to admit that we are not yet great at writing documents ourselves, we are learning and improving all the time through forced use of the technology for ourselves. In summary, Subplot, despite being many years since that fateful original lunch discussion, is what I'd describe as alpha-grade software. It's currently run by two people, myself and Lars Vitsenius. We've had contributions from some of our friends, including the third person at that original Inception lunch, but we are painfully aware that two people cannot possibly represent the full gamut of possible users, nor use cases. So if this sounds at all interesting, we would love to chat with you about how you can help the project. Subplot is under the MIT license to make it as easy as possible to integrate with both open and closed source workflows, 
Rather than re-implementing the world, Subplot uses Pandoc for rendering PDFs and HTML, PlantUML, Dot and Picture for diagramming, and any number of open source libraries to achieve its goals. The project's decision-making process consists of fortnightly meetings where issues are discussed, designs are drawn up, and so on. These meetings are minuted on the Subplot website, and larger design goals are tackled one at a time, and we are currently working on our second such goal, the bringing of our Rust template up to par in order that we can consider it to be fully supported by default. Subplot is written in Rust, though as I mentioned we have a number of language test suite templates built into the tool, the most mature of which is the Python one. We'd love for you to come and join us, and to help Subplot grow to be more useful for the safety community. Perhaps, when we're through with any questions that any of you have about Subplot, we might have a discussion in the channel about safety argumentation and the automated validation of assertions. Do any of you think Subplot or a similar tool might have a place in making safety argumentation validation a more continuous process? Do you have examples of doing that already? Until then, thank you for listening.